friends, welcome this evening for a short half hour of worship and praise and prayer here with us at Sundays at 6. We are so glad that you are here with us. We are missing each other and I miss seeing your faces. I invite you as you can to reach out to someone through the service today to continue to give during our offering time as you can, either at rightsfullumc.org on the app or by a check to the address that's in the description of this video. And let us pray. Oh God, the heavens are your dwelling place. The earth is your footstool and yet you make your presence with us. God, in all of the sacred spaces, in which we are dwelling, in which we are worshiping, be near to us. Take the gifts, the offerings that we have to give. Make them beautiful offerings to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. today is from the middle of the book of Exodus in which God is giving God's people instructions for how to worship God, how to build this building called the tabernacle, which is a tent, essentially, a tent of meeting, a tent of worship. So hear the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to take from me an offering from all whose hearts prompt them to give, you shall receive the offering from me. This is the offering that you shall receive from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastpiece, those garments worn by the priests, and have them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them in accordance with all that I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all of its furniture, so you shall make it. <laughs> Thank you. 
couple of years ago during basketball season, which I'm not sure if it's going to happen this year, but if you have forgotten, it tends to be in the late fall, winter, and early spring. One of my Divinity School classmates had undergone one of the most rigorous rituals of Divinity School, which is camp out, which means you pitch a tent, not a tabernacle kind of tent, but a REI kind of tent out in a football field, a practice field, some sort of empty field of some sort. If you were a medical student or a law student, someone who would be expected to make some money, um, you might buy an RV and put a TV in said RV so that people could have electricity and all sorts of those kinds of things. But the Divinity students, we kind of wanted to be realistic about the prospects of our future earnings and so we camped out in tents. This classmate had camped out in a tent. He had even won one of the coveted tickets, which means you got to choose the games that you wanted to go to first. It had been 36 hours of sleeping outside and going running whenever the, the trumpet sounded. <laughs> not the trumpet of the end of time, but not the shofar of the Hebrews, but the siren of the grad school basketball committee. He had gotten a ticket to the coveted Michigan State game that was playing at Duke, and he could not find someone to cover his shift at the Divinity School Library. So he was stuck during the Michigan State game at the library while the most competitive game of the season, or one of them, was going on. I didn't know this story until I saw something that he had made afterwards. He had taken all of these post-it notes that were with him in the library, and he decided that he was just going to cut them up. At first, he didn't know what he was making. He was just going to angrily cut these post-its in yellow and red and orange and green, and then maybe even a little bit of blue and some brown. He just angrily cut triangles out of these post-its. And then he decided that maybe he was going to make something too. I didn't see anything but the finished product. This piece of art that has traveled on my traveled with me in my moves since Durham. I think I paid maybe $150 for this piece of post-it art slash pain because I love something that has a story behind it, as y'all know. I think one of my favorite things about this piece, I'm not sure if it has a title, I like to call it Pretty Tree, Strange Vortex in response to, you can kind of see it spiraling. One of my favorite parts is right here, the little twig. But I love that at this part to my left of the piece of art, you kind of have the greens of summer. And then eventually <laughs> you get to the yellows and oranges and reds of fall. My classmate probably didn't consider this an act of worship. <laughs> it was an act of maybe keeping his mind busy, doing the best with what he could, maybe even just something to keep his hands occupied when he was frustrated with not being able to be where he wanted to be. I love this piece of art, this posted art, Pretty Tree Strange Vortex, if you want to call it. <laughs> It is maybe not the most photogenic for a home worship service. It catches the glare of the light just a little bit, but it always speaks fall to me. 
as we are going back to school, as we approach September, as we approach six months of pandemic tide, as some of my friends are starting to call this in contrast to Christmas tide or Easter tide, we maybe are cutting out post-its <laughs> as an outlet for our frustration. We maybe are searching for something to do with our hands to make something out of what seems like nothing. That's one reason why I loved the scripture for today, because it talks about making something by hand. Usually handmade either means that something is janky, to quote my coworker, Christina Norville, or that something is so expensive you could never afford it. Think about all of those antiques and primitives and things that if you got them at a rummage sale would probably be cheap, but now that they are marked up as artisan or handcrafted, they somehow balloon up to about 10 times the regular price. God, when he invites the children of Israel to worship him, he doesn't ask them to send away to Egypt for some of their, you know, finest worship materials. <laughs> Go find the dude that was the architect of the pyramids. Go see this super weaver or artisan or the dude that makes Pharaoh's tunics. No, God invites the children of Israel to worship God in something made by hand. They'll call it the tabernacle. My professor Ellen Davis at Duke said this thing that has rung in my ears for years and years since I have been there. But God, in the earliest books of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, tells the patriarchs to make for him altars of simple things like earth, almost too humble to imagine. And even though in the next couple chapters of Exodus, if you read them, there are quite specific instructions on things to make for this tabernacle, this tent, this house of worship. There are candlesticks and an ark to put the manna and the Ten Commandments in. There are lampshades and breastplates for the priests and all sorts of linen ephods and clergy wear. But God invites all of the people to give as their hearts prompt them. They take the things that they gleaned from the Egyptians, the gold, all of their, their skills. A couple of artisans named Bezalel and Aholiab, say that two times fast, are some of the key artisans in this tabernacle building project. I can't help but think that God could have had something come down from heaven that God could have told them to send away for the finest Egyptian stuff, but God welcomes them to use their skill and to create something beautiful by hand for God to be in. I think many of us in these last couple months have thought about sacred space. What is your sacred space? <laughs> it probably looks a lot more casual than a church building. It may be with shorts and slippers instead of high heels or even jeans. It may not have brass candlesticks and fine linen, not even the pyramids, the altar garments that we have at the church building. But God, I think, is tabernacling, is dwelling in all sorts of different places. And so as we think about worshiping God in the wilderness where we are right now, I wonder if you can create a sacred space using a couple of different guidelines. One is that you use what you have. Maybe don't go out and buy a whole bunch of stuff, a whole bunch of, you know, Jesus junk if, as I call it sometimes, things that are 
kind of mass produced just to, I don't know, feel like we have a, put a little spiritual icing on what are, whatever we have at the moment. I wonder what it would look like for you to see the things in your home as part of the worship of God. What would it mean that in this season of ordinary time of growth, that you would find some green in your home, a pillow, a plant, fake or real. And to think about green growing, growing up in Christ. What would it mean for you to look at different pieces of art that you have around your home and ask, how can this lead me into the worship of God? Maybe it's as simple as lighting a candle and reflecting on the presence of Christ with you. But God invites us in this tabernacle worship to bring what we have. I think God also invites us to bring our best. I know for me, sometimes there is this new tendency to, uh, to what's called doom scroll. I'm not sure if anyone is there with me. You kind of scan through your phone, doing that scrolling motion, looking at the newest story, whether it is double hurricanes in the Gulf or murder hornets or something in between. I have, to make a confession to you, started doing another thing called church doom scrolling, which is that at about, mm, I don't know, 9 to 11 on Sunday morning, sometimes I'm scrolling through social media and I see the buttons of everyone's church worship service and I'll click on and watch just five minutes of it, just enough to feel bad about what my own worship experience is. And I wonder how this would be different if instead of thinking about what is not there, even though I think that we are allowed and invited to grieve what we have lost for the time being, I wonder what it would be like to intentionally set a space, a sanctuary, that tabernacle. God, after all, doesn't tell them, okay, just, you know, just, throw some stuff together and um, just, just make it work. Just make it work, as they say on some reality TV shows. No, God gives specific instructions and invites them to give their best. So maybe your best is not dressing up in a dress and a church hat. That might look a little bit funny. Maybe your best is to take some moments to sit up straight to breathe, to light a candle, to maybe watch worship, not on your phone, but on your computer or a, a TV, maybe gathering a friend with you <laughs> to watch, if not in the same space, at least at the same time, maybe taking some time to text, peace of Christ be with you to somebody you're missing to take that time to invite someone to worship with you. Maybe it means having a beverage or something in your hand or a little bit of food that makes worship feel special. How can you give your best to God, even in this strange season? And the last invitation or challenge is to be prepared to move. <laughs> Not move houses necessarily, although that may be something in store. I am thinking of our college students, especially many of whom moved into dorms and began classes in person and now may be moving back home again or moving to a different spot or beginning online classes now. There is this I don't know, transience about life in 2020, that once we kind of get our bearings in one spot, it seems like all the rules have changed. Like we've gone up to a new level and now we've got to figure out the rules. I love that the first place of worship that God sends 
the Hebrew people after they come out of bondage in Egypt is not a place where they are to set up camp forever, to lay down cornerstones and foundations, to have pews and all sorts of stationary things. I think we long for that, but it's not where we are right now. The first place God gives them to worship is portable. It is a tabernacle, a tent. These are things that can be carried. The Ark of the Covenant can be carried on the shoulders of the priests. This is worship that is meant to leave the building. This is worship that is not even in a building. I went camping the last couple weeks for a couple of nights and the one thing I was looking for is something that is easy up and easy down. Tents are by definition not permanent for most of us that have shelter and yet that is where God continues to dwell. So maybe our space of worship is not going to be in the building for a little bit. Maybe it's going to be outside in Wrightsville Beach Park or South Channel Park. Maybe it's gonna be online for a little bit in your homes. Maybe the things that we do are going to need to continue to change so that they can be glorifying to God by being loving and protective and safe to our neighbors. But I also think what needs to change other than just location? I think worship is never meant to be this static forever thing the way that we envision it sometimes. I know at Sundays at 6 we try to do a little bit of ancient meets modern or old time sort of music and bluegrass meets new forms of worship and thought and ideas. And so I'm wondering in this tabernacle time, maybe we could call it that, tabernacle tide. What do you need to be ready to pack up so that you can see what God has for you? Friends, that tabernacle is a picture of what our worship can look like. Worship that is not tied to a building, but that is still excellent. Worship that is intentional. Worship that incorporates the very things that we have to offer, not necessarily someone else's church or worship gathering that you see scrolling around on the internet or driving across town. How can we offer our full selves to God in freedom today? Nobody knows the truth. Oh, no.
pray together. A prayer, this is written by one of my personal saints, Reverend Nadia Boltzweber. This prayer is a prayer about taking turns. And I invite you to pray with me. Dear God, we are just going to be taking turns for a while, if that's okay. Taking turns at freaking out. Sometimes it is ours. Our turn to be afraid because wildfires are so bad that eyes stings, eyes sting and interstates are closed. Our turns to be angry. Please help us not feel bad when it's our turn, Lord. With your grace, may our turns to completely freak out last not one moment longer than is necessary. But may they also last as long as needed in order to let it pass when it's time to move on and just go make the salad for dinner. Lord, help us to be non-anxious presences to the next people whose turn it is. May we not fear their fear so much as fear our failure to listen well. May we offer ourselves without fear of being judged. And Lord, may we remember that even when we are afraid, even when we are terrified, this is not a sign of your absence. And when we feel optimistic and overjoyed, it is not a sign of your presence because you are always with us and because you never take turns. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. praying the same blessing every week at Sundays at 6. It is a blessing about going out and coming in. And so now I invite you to join in that blessing with me. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Goodbye, friends. Have a great evening, a great week, a great whenever you are watching this. Reach out and text a friend and say the peace of Christ be with you. Miss you all. We'll see you next Sunday at 6.